and welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll look at two different ways people represent the rotational state of a 3D body, Euler angles and quaternions, and we'll also discuss some real-world applications of 3D rotations. Even though we live and interact with the world in 3D, much of the physics we do is two or even one dimensional. That makes it much harder for us to construct equations when we really have to think in 3D. All of the different ways that we describe rotations here are valid, but some may make more or less sense to each of you. We'll start with matrix representations, then use them to describe Euler angles. Euler angles are great for lots of physics applications, but there are problems with them when used in robotics, aviation, and video games. So many developers use quaternions to describe rotations instead. Doing 3D animations is a big part of my job, so I do use all of these descriptions when I work on different types of problems. I used modified versions of Euler angles in Mathematica graphics because rotation matrices are a natural part of its graphics language. But when I do animations on the GPU, I use quaternions because manipulations on 4x4 matrices are built into the physical architecture of GPUs. Many of the pros and cons of each method relate to whether or not the coordinate system is based in the lab frame or the body frame. That being said, I find quaternions to be a really natural way of thinking about rotations. The first thing that we're often taught about rotations is that rotations don't commute. On the right, I'm going to rotate the triceratops by 90 degrees about the x-axis and then 90 degrees about the y-axis. On the left, I'll first rotate it about the y-axis and then about the x-axis. At the end, the two dinosaurs are definitely not oriented in the same way. One way to think about this is to note that matrix multiplication doesn't commute. When we want to rotate a point P in three dimensions about some axis, we often use rotation matrices. In physics, to find the position of a point P prime after it has been rotated by some angle theta, then we multiply the vector P by the rotation matrix R where the rotation matrix is on the left of the vector P. This is sometimes called pre-multiplication in computer science. In video games, we often multiply things on the right. This is called post-multiplication. That is because in a first-person viewpoint, the camera is located at the origin and every point in the rest of the world needs to be rotated with respect to the camera. Likewise, instead of actually moving through a level, the player is often kept at the origin at all times while the world moves underneath them. An intermediate notion between these two viewpoints, a fixed lab frame or a fixed body frame, is the description of rotations using Euler angles. The XYZ coordinate system here is in the lab frame, but we want to keep track of what happens to a copy of that coordinate system that gets stuck to the object itself. The description I'm about to show you is a convention we use in physics. There are many other conventions with rotations in different orders about two or three independent axes. First, we'll rotate the body around the z-axis by some angle, we'll call it phi. That gives us the new axes ex and ey in the body frame. Then we'll rotate the body around the new ey axis by angle theta. The z-axis now becomes ez and the ex axis is now ex prime. Lastly, we'll rotate about the new EZ axis by some angle psi. This gives us new coordinates, EX double prime and EY prime in the body frame. We started off with X hat, Y hat, and Z hat extrinsic coordinates and transformed them into new coordinates, EX double prime, EY prime, and EZ, which are now anchored to the rotating body. We can turn this into a rotation matrix. We can construct this in two equivalent ways. Let's start by thinking about all of the objects existing in the lab frame. First, we do our rotation about z hat by angle phi. Then we work out what the new vector ey is in this new coordinate system and write down a rotation matrix for that and multiply it by the result of the first rotation. Then we work out the new vector ez and work out the rotation matrix for a rotation by psi in the EZ direction. And all of that's quite a pain. The other way to think about this is to think about the body coordinates. In this coordinate system, the matrices are much simpler, but the rotation order seems backwards. The first thing we're going to do is rotate by the body's EZ axis by some angle psi. 
and then about its y-axis by some angle, theta, and lastly about its ez-axis again, but this time by angle phi. And this is what we get when we multiply out these three matrices, where S sub psi is sine of the angle psi and C sub phi is cosine of the angle phi. So I'm not going to read this out to you, and I don't expect you to remember it, but understanding how we did this derivation is quite useful. Despite this being an appealing way of writing down a body's 3D rotational state using a single rotation matrix, Euler angles aren't without their problems. Let's look at this slightly different description of the 3D state of a body used in aviation. Here, the frame is fixed in the aircraft's body. One axis is aligned with the direction of motion. Another is the vertical direction, assuming everything in your flight is going well. The last is perpendicular to both of those. Rotations about these are called roll, pitch, and yaw, respectively. These rotations can also be expressed as if the object lived at the center of a gyroscope. Each of the circles in this gyroscope frame in 3D animation and in CAD applications is called a gimbal. This leads us to two problems with Euler angles. When two of the gimbals become coplanar, we effectively freeze out one degree of freedom. That is, we lose the ability to independently control the rotations of the two coplanar gimbals. This is called gimbal lock. This actually happened in the control system on the Apollo 11 moon mission. The stability system got stuck in a gimbal lock configuration, and the pilots needed to manually correct to regain control of the craft. Another problem is that interpolating between two rotation states using Euler angles doesn't make any physical sense, as you can see from the previous animation. Let's try to think about rotations in a totally different way. Imagine we want to describe the direction a vector is pointing in. We could do this using coefficients to multiply unit vectors. But how about this? We could also do this by defining this direction as the point on a unit sphere. Imagine we take the tail of the vector and move that to the origin and make it a unit vector. The tip of that vector will always point to some location on the surface of the sphere. Since this is a two-dimensional space, we need two numbers to describe a 3D direction. Or we could just use a complex number. If instead of a direction, we want to find the whole 3D rotational state for a rigid body, we need a little more information. At every point on the surface of the sphere, the 3D object can rotate about its local EZ axis as well. We can think of the whole 3D rotational state of a rigid body as a point in some other manifold. Constructing this manifold isn't easy. It turns out it's a twisted product of S1 over S2, which gives us a space that's called RP3. This space is a unit 3 ball, which is a sphere with all of its inside filled in, where antipodal points on its boundary get glued together. So the word glue gets glued to the word glue. Okay, so this isn't the easiest thing to visualize, so we can use what's called a double cover of this space to make it a little bit easier. S3 is the unit sphere in four dimensions, but you can think of it as all of Euclidean space where you take the points at infinity and glue them together. Points in S3 are described by quaternions. We'll get back to both of these descriptions in a minute. Quaternions were discovered in 1843 by William Hamilton of Hamiltonian fame. He'd been trying to understand how to extend complex numbers to higher dimensions. At first, he tried to do this with two complex quantities, i and j, but just couldn't get the algebra to work out. So one day, the 16th of October to be precise, he was out walking in Dublin when he realized that his algebra would work if he had three complex coordinates, i, j, and k in his system. He was so excited that he carved the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication into the Broom Bridge. Mathematical vandalism aside, each unit quaternion, i, j, and k, represent rotations by pi about each of the cardinal directions, x, y, and z. Here's a view of RP3 again. Each point inside it corresponds to a unique rotation of our triceratops friend here. So here he's rotating about the plus i direction, and the coefficient of this tells you by how much he's rotated, what fraction of pi. The same with the j direction and the same with the k direction, and these correspond to the cardinal values of x, y, and z. 
That way, a rotation by theta about some unit vector u in R3 equals ux in the x direction, uy in the y direction, and uz in the z direction. This is given by the quaternion q, which equals e to the i theta over 2 times u. After using Euler's identity on the three complex quantities, we get that our new quaternion equals cosine theta over 2 plus ux times the quaternion i plus uy times the quaternion j plus uz times the quaternion k all times sine theta over 2. We can express quaternions in this complex notation or we can look at them as a group. The unit quaternion Q equals A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, where the absolute value of Q equals 1, can be represented as a 2 by 2 complex matrix A plus BI, C plus DI minus C plus DI, A minus BI, where here I is the square root of negative 1 and not one of the quaternions. Or we can represent this by a 4 by 4 real matrix whose values are A minus B minus C minus D, B, A minus D, C, C, D, A minus B, D minus C, B, A. In our Cartesian 3 space, we can write any vector P as a quaternion whose real part is equal to zero then the rotation of this point about some vector q is given by conjugating the point p with the quaternion for the vector q. The new point is given by p prime equals q p q inverse. Likewise, we can express quaternions as an orthogonal matrix of rotations. It turns out the fact that quaternions are points in S3 also solves the janky interpolation you get with Euler angles. A geodesic path that connects two quaternions in S3 actually is a sensible path in that it minimizes unnecessary rotation. And as a bonus, they are even more numerically stable than rotation matrices and Euler angles. Because of the simple relationship between vectors and rotations using quaternions, this is used by a lot of video game designers and roboticists to describe systems with nested sets of rotations, where a rotation state of one part of the object may depend on that of a previous part. Here are some examples from my work. All of the animations I'm showing are from collaborations with Henry Seigerman at Oklahoma State. This is a single arm but we can combine it with five identical copies to make this deployable mechanism. Here's a similar mechanism that doesn't just expand in the cardinal directions. In this video, we explored several ways to describe the 3D rotational state of rigid bodies, rotation matrices, Euler angles, and quaternions. Which of these methods makes the most sense to you? Let me know in the comments. In the next video, we'll use the Euler angle description to derive the Lagrangian formulation for a heavy top. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.